Hello, and welcome to the introduction to the definite integral presented by www.free-academy.com. Now, if you recall from the last lecture, we found that the definite integral was derived from doing an infinitely large number of rectangular summations underneath the curve along a certain integral. And what we came up with is this formula located here. The integral from a to b of f of x dx equals the area under the curve. Now what I've done just to kind of show things out a little bit is I wrote our formula notation. This is general where you could use any a or b or f of x or anything. And then I did is I put uh, some numbers into it so you can see it in action. The integral of x squared equals one third x to the third. You may be wondering what this line is with the numbers. That means that you're evaluating between a or b, or in our case in the purple line, 0 and 2. That's just a little notation there, and it means the exact same thing as what comes in the line next to it. So f of x, or capital F of x, which is of course the integral of little f of x, line a to b equals f of b minus f of a. That's our area under the curve. In the case of x squared from 0 to 2, that will give us an area of 8 thirds. So, quick, nice and easy introduction to what our indefinite integral is. Remember that you leave out the integration constant in indefinite integrals. It doesn't give any useful information. So hopefully, even if you're a little confused after the last lecture with the Riemann sums, that should clarify things to you. We're not going to get into doing any definite integrals in this lecture here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to write out a couple of rules that you need to know before you get into this. Um, our rule number one, that if you take the integral from a to a of f of x dx, the definite integral will always equal zero. And this makes a tremendous amount of sense. If we were to go and go from 2 to 2 of our x squared, we get 1 third, 2 to the third, minus 1 third, 2 to the third, which of course is going to equal 0. And it makes sense for another reason too, because if you were to take your curve and you were going to evaluate it with 0 width, no width whatsoever, of course it's going to have 0 area. Area formula is length times width. So that's rule number 1. Rule number two, that if you take the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx, that is going to equal the negative integral from b to a of f of x dx. We'll use our uh, x squared example. If we did the integral from 2 to 0 of x squared dx, that's going to give us 1 third 0 to the third minus 1 third 2 to the third, which equals negative 8 thirds. It's going to be the same area either way. It just affects your negative sign. And that should uh, follow intuitively as well. Erase this there. Our rule number 3. If you take the integral from a to c of f of x dx, that's going to uh, equal the integral, and let's say you have another point b that's uh, greater than a and less than c. Throw that out there really quick. Okay, so you take the definite integral from a to c of f of x dx, that's equal to the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from b to c of f of x dx. And this is another thing that should follow logically as well. If we draw a little graph here and we draw a curve, we'll put in some points a, b, c, 
you can see that if you uh, add the areas from A to B to the area from B to C, that it's going to be the overall area anyways. And truth be told, this one comes up. You will use this. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. Let's see if there's anything else. All right, so this is a little obscure. I've never actually used this in my mathematical career. But just to put it out there, uh, just in case you would like to know it, if f is integrable on the interval from a to b, I guess that's a b, and then it's also greater than 0, greater than or equal to 0 for all x on a to b, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is going to be greater than or equal to 0. And this is kind of a dull statement. You have some function, it does whatever, but it's always greater than zero. This says that you are going to have a positive area. Well, of course, because it's always has area. And I guess it's something worth mentioning. Um, maybe this was a uh, is a little bit too early for me to say that this was an obvious statement because if you were to have an equation that did something like this this is a positive area and below the negative x-axis is negative area and you would actually subtract the two and it gets a little bit interesting when you have uh, say sine or cosine functions because your area above and below on any on a set certain intervals is exactly the same. So this is cosine from zero to pi. If you were to take the integral of cosine from zero to pi, you would get an area of zero because the positive subtracts out the negative. Another thing that follows from the same uh, formula right there, if you have two functions, f and g, and f is greater than g, uh, two functions integrable on an interval a to b, and f is greater than g for all x on a to b, then your integral of f of x dx is going to be greater than your integral of g of x dx. And this is the exact same formula as we had before where your g of x equaled 0. That was our previous case. So that is basic introduction to indefinite integrals. Hopefully that was helpful to you guys.